We have a winner, please. Bringing broadband to those who need it most. Uh, we are going to have four panels, so we're going to try to keep this on schedule. Uh, I am David Gross. I'm acting as moderator here, uh, which means I get to make about a minute worth of opening comments, of which I've now done about 60, you know, almost 60 seconds worth. And then we're going to hear from Ambassador Danny Sapolova with some opening remarks, and we're going to go immediately into the next panel. Now, the key, as with all IGF workshops, to make this interesting and successful and useful is to ensure that you all have an opportunity to participate. Many of you will be on panels, but those of you who are not on panels, I welcome your participation. We need your participation. And that's true for those who are listening remotely. So we are set up, of course, for full participation. I like this to be as lively and interesting a session. And it seems to me that one of the points that might be worth discussing and we'll be going through this is the topic we've been given is bringing broadband to those who need it most, which sounds to me like competition, as if some people need it more than others. My experience has been that everyone needs it. Everybody wants it. And if they don't want it, it's because they don't know about it yet. So I'm not sure about the need to have identify people who need it the most. What we need to do is get it to everyone in an affordable fashion. With that incredibly brief, for me at least, introduction <laughs> to the subject, let me turn the microphone over to the U.S. Ambassador who is responsible for all of these issues and policy, Ambassador Danny Sapolova, who many of you have already seen up on the big stage. He's the hardest working man at the IGF because he's been on like three or four panels already. And with that, Danny, can you give us an introduction? Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it. And Garland, wherever you are, thank you for, uh, for the invitation. Um, this is actually a subject that's very close to my heart and something that I've worked on domestically for many, many years. So, you know, I think we can all agree that connecting the world to broadband is critical to growth and development and that failing to expand access to the network would further exacerbate inequality among populations and undermine our collective economic and political stability. What we are here to discuss is what the best strategy for making the benefits of broadband technologies widely available in all countries is. As everyone knows, the wires, the wireless devices, the digital infrastructure that makes connecting people to the internet possible are very expensive. And the cost per person of establishing the connection in rural areas where people are dispersed is much greater than in cities where people are concentrated. And because broadband service is a connection that allows for the delivery of multiple services rather than a single service, the revenue derived per consumer is greater in wealthier consumers than in less wealthy consumers, obviously, because they purchase more of the services that can come over the pipe. But the input costs are the same. The, the wire production is the same. So the challenge for, to deploying broadband networks in poor and rural communities is that it's hard to recoup the cost of the build out and harder to make a profit on a per person basis. So how do we overcome that economic reality and bring service to rural and poor communities around the world to ensure that everyone gets access? That's, it's un, undeniably a difficult question to answer. But we are here and we are participating on this panel. You all are here in this room because we believe that we have a moral responsibility to answer the question. We have an economic self-interest in getting it right, and we have a duty to construct public policy strategies that will meet the challenge by expanding access. The communal benefit of broadband deployment is undeniable. One recent study estimates that when internet penetration rises by 10% in an emerging economy, it correlates with an incremental GDP increase of 1% to 2%. For developed nations, the impact of Fixed line broadband penetration is also important to economic growth. An increase of broadband uh, access in developed countries of 10 subscribers per 100 inhabitants corresponds to a 1.2% increase in per capita GDP, GDP growth. But to overcome the very real economic challenges of connecting those still unconnected, it's imperative to understand that there is not a one-size-fits-all solution. So this means truly considering a range of options from purely market-based solutions that seek to improve the regulatory environment to encourage investment, to public-private partnerships that seek to create collaborative uh, opportunities, 
to financing from international development banks and cross-subsidization within countries under universal service programs. It's also vital to consider the security of this critical infrastructure, as well as the need to also enhance legal frameworks as connectivity increases. And it is in gatherings like this where frank conversations can open the door to innovative ideas and spark a change to facilitate growth. For your consideration, I'd like to now touch on three efforts of the U.S. government, and then I look forward to hearing from the panels and from all of you. The United States has made a commitment to expanding broadband in the first instance through our Global Broadband and Innovations Program. This program is administered by USAID. It focuses on providing technical assistance to expand access and encourage the use of applications in order to extract greater value from the expanding network. A significant manifestation of this commitment is the Broadband Partnership of the Americas, which is designed to improve access to broadband and the internet in other communications technologies in the Americas. The financial and technical resources we mobilize through Broadband Partnership for Americas includes developing and implementing national broadband strategies, creating or upgrading universal service funds to finance the expansion of mobile and broadband technologies to rural communities, improving international and regional connectivity by linking existing broadband networks, collaborating on a regional effort to harmonize the use of digital spectrum, and sharing best practices. Another program that we are excited about is the Alliance for Affordable Internet. A new coalition of private sector, public sector, and civil society organizations who have come together to advance the shared aim of providing an affordable internet access in developing countries. The U.S. government proposed this initiative last year with the hope of leveraging the expertise of various stakeholders with a specific goal of lowering the cost of access. In less developed countries, only around one-third of, of the population is connected to the Internet, primarily because of persistently high access costs. This is acting as a major barrier to socio, uh, sociological and economic development, and the Alliance for Affordable Internet is eager to work with like-minded countries to lower these barriers. We heard, uh, we heard a little bit about it from uh, the woman from Nigeria yesterday, I believe. The Alliance officially launched earlier this month in Nigeria as an independent entity with membership that includes the Grameen Foundation, the Internet Society, Invineo, Google, Facebook, and many other key players from the private, public, and not-for-profit sectors from developed and developing countries, and has included financial support of governments such as the UK and Sweden. It is our hope that A4AI, which is the acronym for this, uh, proposal can become the first truly global coalition to tackle this issue head on. In practice, the Alliance will identify and address regulatory and legislative barriers to accessibility, compile case studies around specific success stories, and promote bilateral and regional cooperation to establish legislative and regulatory best practices. We are thrilled by the enthusiasm surrounding this program so far. We applaud its aspiration to help participating countries reach the Broadband Commission's target of entry-level broadband services priced at less than 5% of average monthly income. Finally, the U.S. government intends to make broadband expansion a topic of international conversations wherever possible. We believe it's a critical issue for the Internet community to coalesce around, and we intend to do all we can in our ability to focus attention on these needs and possibilities. So we'll continue to seek opportunities like this workshop to engage, listen, and collaborate. We'll look to next year's World Telecommunications and Development Conference as a key opportunity to work with the ITU's member states on meaningful solutions, and we'll remain committed to devoting our own resources to help expand the accessibility of broadband worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Sapolova. Uh, that was a terrific beginning. Uh, it's showing the U.S. government's commitment both as a matter of policy as well as a commitment in terms of resources, which is extraordinarily important and continues a long tradition there. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to give you what I've been told is the theme. I'm not sure exactly how, uh, how important the theme is here. But the theme of the panels that we're about to hear from is that with so, uh, high-capacity submarine cable access, going and uh, interconnecting with fiber optic networks expanding throughout many countries and serving, as we heard, major urban areas and capitals. What about the rural areas? How do we provide service to rural areas in a way that is economically efficient, sustainable, and provides the robust connectivity that people in that region need and deserve? 
We're going to hear from the first panel with some examples. Uh, they've been told that they have five minutes. I'm hoping that they'll do it in less than five minutes because every minute they save is more time for interaction and the discussion about these things. Uh, we, we're going to start with Mark Summer, who is with NVIDIA. Uh, Mark, can you give your pres a very brief presentation? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mark Summer, and the organization is in Venio. We are a nonprofit organization, and we focus um, on delivering connectivity and general access to ICTs in really underserved areas of emerging countries, and mostly in Sub Saharan Africa, but we work as well in Haiti and some of the Pacific Islands, um, as well as a little bit in South and Southeast Asia. One thing to recognize when we try to talk about what is rural and underserved, in Africa, 80% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa lives outside of the urban centers. It's actually a whole continent which is largely rural, and significant parts of the population don't live in towns like Nairobi, Mombasa, or Kampala, which have good service, but this majority doesn't. Um, that's as well true in places like Indonesia, where there are definitely significant sized towns, but once you leave them, there are significant percentages of the population who don't have access to appropriate communication services. Um, cost and revenue per customer is a key component of why services don't reach out these areas. So reducing cost for um, building out these services and operating these uh, is a key focus of ours. And those are the three examples I want to just mention very briefly. Um, for example, in Kenya, we're working with an island in Lake Victoria um, where there's a significant um, prevalence of HIV um, AIDS um, infections and the population um, is most, mostly fishing and very poor. Um, we're working there with an NGO who has been trying since many years to get access to affordable broadband. The only option they had so far was satellite. So we worked there together with one of the existing service providers um, in a town onshore um, and established actually a wireless link from onshore to the island, which is about 90 kilometers distance from the closest fiber optic connection. Um, and we used equipment which didn't cost us more from an equipment perspective than about $2,000 to do that link. That now brings to this island, to that NGO, but as well surrounding areas, a number of locations are getting connected, more than 10 megabits of service, and it can be upgraded to do further. What is really key here is the service providers hadn't looked at these new emerging technologies, and once they had looked at them, they didn't quite know how to integrate them into their networks. So these are really important things we have been doing there, and we need to um, see get much more common. Um, a lot of smaller rural um, service providers do this already in the U.S. and other places, and we're really trying to take these, these models outside of that. Um, what this means on that island is um, people have access um, to these technologies, to communications, and really understand what their status means in terms of the HIV status, but as well how to improve their income situation and, and so forth. Another project I just want to mention briefly um, in Haiti, we started working after the earthquake um, and really um, saw that after the immediate need of getting connectivity and, and, and services back up and running in the Port-au-Prince area, that actually Port-au-Prince has a good coverage of service providers and broadband service. But again, a significant chunk of the population doesn't live in the capital um, and outside was very little service um, options for real broadband services. So here we work together with in, um, incumbent service providers of establishing a shared network using low-cost technologies and training local entrepreneurs um, to ensure sustainability of, of these technologies. And um, the local entrepreneurs are operating that network on behalf of the service providers who are sharing the network. By themselves, they wouldn't have invested in a network like this, but we use donor funding ultimately to establish infrastructure they didn't want to invest in. And now we're seeing more and more customers being connected in those rural regions, which are mostly um, organizations benefiting their communities. That's schools, that's hospitals, um, that's government offices. Of course, there are as well businesses, but that's just emerging. So we're really looking at how can we connect those key organizations in those communities um, to broadband services and then reach further out. And I think at that point I should really end it and pass it over to Bob. 
Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Bob Pepper is a senior executive with Cisco who has extraordinary experience uh, in this area and is a global leader. Bob, take it away. Thank you. So um, one of the things I do is sit on the UN Broadband Commission. And we're focused, um, as the ambassador said, to bring broadband everywhere. Uh, and that includes uh, the target of making broadband affordable measured by spending, the, the price for broadband should be no more than 5% of uh, household income. Uh, and actually, we've, we've made progress along those lines. One of the things we did uh, two years ago, three years ago, when, we, when the commission was created, recommend that countries have national broadband plans. Um, and uh, this year, and by the way, the number of plans has increased more than doubled as a result of that recommendation. Uh, there's over 130 countries now that have plans. There's still about 60 that don't. Um, but this year what we did was we asked the question that was always dangerous to ask, which is if you have a national broadband plan, does it make a difference? And uh, we did a study with the um, uh, Broadband Commission staff uh, from the ITU. We looked at 165 countries, 10 years of data, and the analysis is called a panel regression. And it's not just correlational, but it's causal. And what we found was that if you have a plan, it does make a difference. And there are four takeaway conclusions I want to mention. The first one is the difference between having a plan and not having a plan. Uh, if you have a plan, it actually can increase on average, especially across the emerging economies. Uh, it can actually increase uh, fixed broadband adoption by 25%. It can increase mobile broadband adoption by 30%. Second conclusion um, or finding, competition matters. Right? We kind of know this, but empirically we have real evidence. The difference between, in mobile, uh, for mobile broadband, the difference between monopoly and competition is that where you have competition, it doubles, it doubles mobile broadband adoption. Third conclusion, public-private partnerships are the best way to achieve the goals. Um, Government by itself can't do it. Government doesn't have the money to invest. Government doesn't understand the technology. It's not at the cutting edge. It tends to be behind. Government processes tend to be incremental. Industry by itself, if you just leave it to the market, there will be gaps, especially in the rural and underserved areas and for low-income people. So what we found was that the plans that were uh, combinations where government sets the vision, sets the goals, sets out the, the objectives, but the private sector is primarily responsible for the um, deployment, except where there are the gaps. Um, those are the um, uh, broadband plans that have been most effective. And as the ambassador said, you know, there are places where um, government has a role to fill those gaps, and it may be, um, you know, uh, a variety of financial incentives, whether it's, you know, tax incentives or um, low-cost loans or whatever, um, those are effective. Fourth conclusion, broadband plans need regular review and they need to be refreshed on a regular basis. We found that the average broadband plan was seven years old, way too long. The markets are far too dynamic, the technology is changing more rapidly, and that what we believe is that uh, national broadband plans need to be reviewed every two or three years and updated and refreshed. So the question then is, if, a national broad, if having a plan is so important and it does make a difference, what does a good plan look like? Um, we did a study that was published by the World Economic Forum and the Global Information Technology Report it was published in April. And what we found was that the, a, a balanced, broad-based national broadband plan, and by the way, it doesn't have to be national. It can be regional, provincial, or even local. But a, a balanced broadband plan includes five elements on the supply side and five elements on the demand side. It's not just about building networks and increasing reach. The supply side components include, uh, uh, and later with you know, time uh, or offline, I'm happy to go into details, supply side includes competition, elements on competition and investment, spectrum allocation assignment spectrum for broadband, reducing infrastructure deployment costs, access to things like rights-of-way, uh, eliminating, frankly, local barriers to building out, um, core network expansion that's market-led uh, that are um, components 
including what we've already heard about uh, undersea cables, access to opening up um, uh, landing stations, internet exchange points, and then having inclusive broadband availability with, for example, universal service programs. On the demand side, we include elements of making the devices more affordable. This is also reducing taxes on devices, reducing uh, 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 luxury taxes, what I sometimes refer to as the sin taxes. This is one of, this is the only sector that has taxes as high as tobacco and alcohol, right? Taxes are a matter of life, but don't overtax this sector. What we should be doing is reducing taxes to make it more affordable. Third, uh, second, government leadership in broadband usage, uh, government leadership in the online activity, and government being a smart uh, buyer of uh, broadband services that, that extend the availability uh, and also create, help create the business uh, case. Third, ICT skills and development, right? Skills on how to use broadband, both by consumers and small business. Um, fourth, online uh, and local content, local applications, local language content. And then finally, fifth on the demand side is consumer protection. And we believe that having a balance of all of these elements on supply and demand will make the most effective broad-based balanced broadband plans, um, and we know that having a plan makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, now going from uh, that policy sort of global view, we're going to hear from Omar, who is with the uh, uh, National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan, uh, who's going to talk to us, uh, brief us a bit about what's going on in Afghanistan and the good news out of Afghanistan at least as to broadband. Uh, thank you. Um, um, uh, my name is Omar Ansari. Um, um, uh, I'm uh, president of the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan and presiding a, a firm called Tech Nation, um, uh, where we provide uh, uh, in um, access services, community technology and incubator management services to uh, different um, um, uh, population groups in Afghanistan. Um, I'll be talking about uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, the situation uh, of the internet uh, usage in the country, in a specific case uh, about um, a project that we are doing, it's called Tech Dera. Um, uh, about 86% uh, uh, of Afghanistan is covered by uh, telecom um, uh, services. Um, that's uh, between 2003 and 2011. And before that, Afghanistan uh, didn't have any uh, telecom um, uh, provider in the country. And um, uh, it was only line phones that were uh, traditionally provided by Ministry of Communications and uh, that would be local analog uh, connectivity <coughs> for providing that to the people. And most of the time Afghans would uh, travel to the neighboring countries to make an international call. Uh, but today uh, we have uh, about 18 million um, um, uh, mobile phone users we have five, five telecom operators and about um, uh, 50 ISPs are licensed in the country. Optical fiber network is introduced uh, which helped reduce the cost of uh, telephone. Um, uh, and um, uh, 12, of, uh, 12 out of uh, 34 provinces uh, are connected through fiber. Um, in this uh, fiber uh, does not only connect the Afghan cities, but it also connects uh, neighboring countries like Pakistan, Iran, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. And Afghanistan provides the only regional hub uh, in Central Asia that connects South Asia to, uh, to Central Asia and Middle East with the, with the two uh, regions. <coughs> Um, we have DSL in six major provinces of Afghanistan, uh, but with with all this, we we only have uh, two million, uh, which uh, which makes eight percent of the Afghan population uh, having access to uh, to the internet. That's that's very low, 
internet price in 2000, uh, um, uh, initially in 2002, was 5,000 uh, US dollars per MB, um, uh, where the ISPs were using uh, uh, satellite for the internet access, but it reduced to 300 um, uh, US dollars, uh, and now it's about uh, 97 US dollars per MB. Uh, and further reduction is planned by the government. Uh, it's in pipeline. Um, mm, uh, this shows that uh, uh, b b major um, um, internet users are based in the urban areas, but in the rural areas, we still have a, uh, an issue of connectivity. And the two basic reasons are uh, the price of uh, the internet um, in, the, um, in the connectivity issue in the rural areas. And the other prob challenge and problem uh, the um, uh, Afghans in the rural area ha uh, areas have that technology is not in their language, uh, nor the content is in their language. Uh, so they do not know how to utilize um, uh, technology. Uh, what we are doing in order to address uh, um, the issue of connectivity and affordability in Afghanistan, um, uh, we have set up uh, uh, community technology centers branded as TechDera. And TechDera uh, Dera is a traditional meeting place for the villagers in the, um, in rural um, Afghanistan where they come together, they hold their jirgas business meetings. It's normally under uh, a big tree uh, where their uh, Afghan bits and uh, people come and sit there and discuss it. It serves like a club. So, And in, in general, it's a, a community center. So we brought that concept together and in, in, uh, combined it with a technology and called our technologies, uh, community technology centers, TechDeras. Uh, TechDera is Afghanistan's uh, first and fastest growing community technology center. It improves lifelong learning for children, youth, and, and adults. It creates a new generation of leader, uh, leaders, develops technology and management skills of the uh, of the community. Um, it provides a common networking and support platform and um, uh, is a multi-purpose uh, facility allowing Afghan women and men to establish many programs and services that can provide technology support in, um, uh, in social and economic benefits. Um, it was initiated in Kabul in 2011 and it's expanding to other major cities in Afghanistan. Uh, the services uh, TechDera, uh, TechDera has provide uh, are uh, public access and connectivity. Currently, we are using WiMAX technologies to connect our TechDera uh, uh, with, a, with a backbone and um, uh, then using uh, Wi-Fi to, uh, to connect the, the users at TechDera. Uh, we have membership services that provide uh, mm, uh, access uh, services uh, 24 by 7 to our members, uh, enhancing technical professional capacity and many more. Um, uh, training and education services, we provide uh, computer training, uh, social media and communication training, leadership and management, um, in trust building, uh, business development training, writing and public speaking trainings, and job skills trainings. Uh, with that, um, we provide mentoring and counseling services to our members, um, job search and internships, uh, entrepreneurial and e-commerce services, digital printing and multimedia services so that people can come in um, uh, in, in access uh, technology as well as uh, uh, utilize the, the uh, printers and multimedia devices there. And it also provides gaming and entertainment uh, um, uh, services and facilities to our members. With that, um, 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 we host uh, tech communities. There are a few uh, communities established in Afghanistan that includes open source Afghanistan, tech women Afghanistan, um, and uh, open so regional open source alliance of Central Asia. 
uh, Afghanistan Computer Science Association. So they all utilize, um, uh, they take there as a common place for the meetings um, in, in access services as well as holding their, uh, their events uh, in, in the meeting with each other to, uh, to work on uh, different uh, activities in the care. Um, that's it. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Omar. Let me call on Jackie uh, and also uh, Kathleen uh, from Internews to come up and join this panel. What I thought might make sense is, uh, since we're running a little behind, is rather than go and have Q&A uh, for this panel, we'll hear from the next panel, uh, which has very complimentary, uh, uh, particularly to what uh, was being uh, talked about by, by, uh, by Pepper and others. We'll have that, and then we'll go immediately from that to Q&A. So as you, uh, uh, as you are listening to these presentations from Jackie and from, uh, and from Kathleen, please prepare your questions as well. We've got seats over here. Right. Kathleen from Internews, could you, uh, she's going to talk a little bit about uh, local access, meaning local policy, which is obviously uh, comes very directly from what we were just hearing. We were hearing very specific stories together with, from Pepper, some of the underlying policy uh, imperatives. Kathleen? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, my name's Kathleen Reen. I work with our ICT programs and policy at Internews, which is an international media and IT development organization that works in about 45 countries around the world. And a few weeks ago, I was talking to um, uh, an NGO uh, based in Eastern Africa um, about how they were going to work on policy frameworks to expand broadband access in their own country. And he said, listen, Kathleen, the broadband idea starts across the massive seabeds around the world. And on those seabeds are those pipes that are the global commons. But the moment it hits my country, it's completely local. And when we're thinking about policy frameworks, you have to remember that they're entirely focused on the legal and rule of law environments and the marketplace that's specific to every single country in the world. And so that's some of the thinking that we've had to bring to how we address this issue regarding uh, getting broadband to rural areas, but also making it more affordable. So some of the least likely places are presenting the first experiments and ideas for how we can start to think about this. Uh, in June of this year, uh, Burma, Myanmar uh, granted the first licenses as part of a massive deregulation effort for its mobile network operators to a Qatari-based firm, Urudu, uh, and uh, to Norway's Telenor. And under that deal, with more than 90 countries, uh, sorry, 90 providers applying, part of the question in their submissions and their applications had to be how they would deal with so-called last mile. And so the winners were the true winners of a whole country. So the commitment is that within two years, they'll get access across 90% of the country. Right now, there's only 9% coverage. So this is a promise and an idea and an experiment, but it's spelling out how in the developing world and the global south, there's some new thinking being brought to bear um, around these issues. Now, at the same time, the Telecommunications Act in Myanmar is, is yet to be passed and has been up for debate and development uh, for more than 12 months. And it's been held up by something pretty fantastic, uh, which is a, an enormous engagement with civil society and the private sector to get inputs. Now, it's rocky, it's really difficult, uh, and it's an experiment that doesn't have a huge amount of precedent anywhere else yet in the developing world. But it is one of the positive signs in an environment that's traditionally considered one of the most censored and repressive and difficult for access to information and dissemination of information. So we're seeing some potential lessons there for how we can think about these issues. The newest country in the world, South Sudan, is contending with the same question. And uh, while internet access has grown 3,000% in Africa over the last decade, uh, Sudan represents some of the lowest access rates in the world. And so they don't even have a broadband plan yet, but what they do have is an emerging discussion about how to provide mobile and how that mobile will actually be broadband in its offerings. The big challenge for South Sudan is that they're also learning lessons, and those lessons bring to bear whether or not and how policy should be prioritised when bringing that broadband. 
So it's a big surprise to many people that there's a presidential initiative actually focused on internet security before there's a broadband plan. And when we think about rule of law, setting those priorities is actually up for grabs. And there's a broader discussion to be had about how those priorities are set and who's participant in those discussions and what kind of transparency is, is actually brought to bear. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, we're next going to hear from Jackie Roth, Vice President from Verizon, who has been active in this area for uh, I was going to say many years, that would be probably impolite of me to say. <laughs> uh, almost as long as me. That's true. Jackie. It's great. I think one of the things we're doing here is we're crowdsourcing policy ideas because you'll hear similar themes being repeated. So I want to talk about uh, three examples or, or three issues. Uh, Verizon is uh, in the US a big mobile service provider. Globally, we provide enterprise services, cloud services around the world, but in the US. So we're very familiar with trying to serve what, even in our own country, as the ambassador had said, are underserved areas, rural, et cetera. And uh, the latest thing that we and others are doing is fourth generation wireless. Uh, and our regulator and our government in general has made a strong commitment to finding enough spectrum and suitable spectrum to do that, and obviously this is applicable around the world. In fact, I was uh, recently reading a March study from, let's see, Research ICT Africa, which really illustrated the extent to which mobile, broadband, and communications generally are so very important. It had done, looked at 11 African countries and found so many instances where the first access to internet was mobile instances where users were using Facebook, and I've heard that discussed here a couple times, uh, using mobile Facebook access much more than uh, email or other types of access. So uh, that, that's clearly happening. So I would say you know, the key policy point, get the spectrum out there, have certainty associated with it, um, and think seriously about how as governments to promote fourth generation, LTE is a standard that we're using and is being used in 124 countries to some extent. Second point um, uh, is obviously what we're talking about. You need a favorable policy environment. And I was, I think just last week, at a meeting of the GSM Association, so it's operators from all around the world, and heard a very interesting description of a project that that association had done with ministers from six Southern Africa countries, and they'd signed a program, a, uh, a, a communique of a vision for digital Southern Africa in September on ways to promote universal access to broadband and associated services. So what were the themes there? Joint public-private efforts, just like uh, Bob Pepper said public awareness, uh, widespread deployment of e-government as a complement to the private sector's investment, develop a roadmap, sounds like a plan, broadband plan, and then of course spectrum, harmonize frequency allocation plans among those countries to the extent possible, uh, and look at a wide-ranging review of policies including, so it's not just the internet services, but education, science, technology, innovation, and new capacity building. Okay, I thought that was a, a very interesting illustration of the local policy. Third major point, demand drivers against, again, what people have been talking about a bit, but since we offer enterprise services, that could be a school system, it could be a large company, it could be healthcare system, and so on. This is front of mind to us. But um, these are really uh, sort of anchor tenants that create demand. They're offering important community services or important business services, but they're also creating a certain level of demand that can get the broadband built that is then used by everybody, including the individual users, of course. So they're anchor tenants. They're wanting reliable, high-quality, skilled technical workforce, an important part of the uh, ecosystem. They're often using broadband in ways that have multiplier effects. One project I've been interested in hearing about recently is for community health workers. It's mobiles for midwives. M4M, 
<laughs> the acronym. So these midwives obviously are helping with childbirth. That's a very important part of the health care system. But they're also doing birth registrations, which in many uh, particularly developing countries are just not happening. And if you're never registered upon birth, then you're just not part of the system thereafter. So in a way, it's having a multiplier effect. Uh, and then finally, on the broadband policy plans, certainly agree on their importance. I would add a dimension of multi-stakeholderism there, because I think that uh, particularly if you're looking at the demand and what are the services going to be used for, the input into decision making by the many stakeholders is very important. And the cutting across governmental silos so if you're, we now can look toward telehealth on these broadband networks, we need to get the people who deal with medical devices and our mobile phones medical devices. We need to have education teacher training for using mobile devices in the education system. So those are the main points that I thought would be useful. Terrific. Thank you. Let me open it up to the audience either for questions, we already have a couple of questions, or examples of what you see in your country that might be of interest. Let me go right over here. And then I think you need a microphone so that remote participants can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my name is Antosa from Indonesia. I just have a, one question. Are you happy with the quality of the ICT in this building? <laughs> no, I just want to check it. OK, that is our dream. Oh, thank you. That is our dream. But when you go out, you will find difficulty. You will find difficulty because if I may say again that I am from the Santosa, my name, I am from the uh, ICT Society of Indonesia. So since 2009, I convinced the government that we need broadband. We need broadband and then we try to put that in the five year development plan. The definition of broadband of Indonesia, government of Indonesia is the speed 512 kilobit per second. This 209. And we are trying, no. For me, broadband should be minimum 2 mega. This 2 mega. Very ideal to 2 mega. Then we are preparing, no, I think within this week, we prepare our national broadband plan. This is for the next president, not for this current president. We will be finished uh, next year. This is the first. The second, why is it slow, so slow? This because, if I may say, 90% of the broadband in Indonesia carried out by wireless. 5% with the cable. So th this is the problem again. For me, I work for the info in the development of telecommunication already 40 years. So I'm very conservative. For me, 60% of the traffic must be carried by physical. And 40%, you can use the wireless. You can enjoy the wireless. But if not, like in Indonesia, no, 95% carried by wireless, you have problem. Lot of stagnation. Even though you are dongle, using dongle 7.2 mega, when you download, you can get only one kilobit per second. This is the fact. Well, so therefore, uh, I appreciate very much with the topic of this discussion, but actually, not the submarine cable. The most important for a country like Indonesia is the last mile. Within the big island, we have fiber optic. We have the satellite. We have the microwave. Very luxury. We have the toll road, but we don't have to go to the home. This is the problem again regarding the last mile. When I invite the uh, telcos operator, also my members, he said the payback period is too long. From 10 telcos in Indonesia, only one national. That is Telkom. That's my company before. The rest, the nine, is all foreign company. So we liberalize more than liberal country. Then. Because there is come from the investor, uh, foreign investor, they only have the short side. They prefer using the GSM, 3G, and maybe the next LTE. 
Okay, this is situation what happened. Why is actually, if I may stay upstream? This is because we lack of leadership. We lack of leadership, including, let's say, from the country or until in the village. So when you build the rural, if you just provide the network, but the head of the village, they don't have the feel, they don't have the, let's say, leadership, I think useless. So therefore, we campaign also, no, the next, will be maybe next month, we will have a big uh, conference, what we call that meaningful broadband. Okay, no, I, I just want to say that Me meaningful broadband, it means this will be affordable, you already discussed. The second is useful, the third is empowering. With these three, let's say, uh, if I may say, approach, I think it will be that. So I say, thank you very much for that. Let's get some quick reactions, uh, particularly on the issue of leadership and those three points. There's so much to say, actually, to the points you made. I could take a whole hour for this. So I'll concentrate just on a few, few ones which I think are really important. You mentioned there are 10 telcos in the country. There's only one domestic. Actually, in Indonesia, you have many service providers. The problem is many don't have a lobby. You, the big service providers, being the GSM operators, are represented very well. The small service providers like the ISPs in Bali, the ISPs all over your country, they're not represented well. They don't have a clear voice. And they provide, I think, very key service, especially when you look at the rural areas, um, which is where those big guys don't want to build out, or if they build out, um, because of the low income potential for them, they might have a 3G base station there, but the backhaul might be under provision. They might have too many people competing for the same base station. The, the technologies they're using make a lot of sense in certain environments, but in other environments, you need different technologies. You need, like you say, wired or fixed line or fixed wireless. Um, so I think this is a really important point of, of separation, of looking where the problem is. Um, I think you, you really put the, the um, hit the nail on the head when you said the last mile is the key. The key in order for a good last mile is good middle mile fiber in my mind. If we can get good middle mile fiber to key points so local ISPs or GSM operators can build out their networks and compete with each other. I really want to see that competition happen head to head. Let then the best one win. Then you will have, I think, an affordable broadband um, offering. Yeah, Thank you very much. Uh, and, and before, Perry, if you don't mind, uh, is there another question we can have? Because we need to get, uh, and maybe we can package them up, and you can, uh, since Pepper can talk about anything, uh, we can do that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Let me bring this over to you, I guess. I keep hoping that there are more microphones, so I, it's the way I get my exercise. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shazna from Indonesia. I'd like to, I'm trying to get my head around how broadband plans increase adoption. I think that's what you said, 25% for fixed and 30 for mobile. Um, is it because of government mandates that re require the operators to provide access? And if that is the case, then what about incentives? The correct, is that the correct incentives for operators? And also, it's not only about providing affordable internet, while that is important uh, to all, it is also about giving adequate quality of service. We manage some, I manage some uh, research in Learn Asia that where we go to a couple of cities and test broadband connection, and these are urban, usually capital cities forget the rural, and the internet is not even 256 kbps. So I'd like your thoughts on that, please. So that actually fits very nicely to what I was going to say to the you know, earlier um, comments, which is leadership make, actually makes a huge difference. Right? We've looked at that in some previous studies, that national leadership, um, or it could be regional or even local leadership, makes a difference. And that's where having the plan, it focuses, um, it's not necessarily government mandates, but by focusing, by having a plan, and by the way, some of the plans that we looked at were nothing more than a statement by a prime minister or president saying that broadband was important, right? On the other extreme, not extreme, but the other end, right, um, you have 
uh, similar to what's going to be announced at this major conference on November 13th and 14th uh, in Jakarta on meaningful broadband for Indonesia. That is the result of several years of uh, intensive work, and it's going to be a national strategy. When that occurs, what happens is that the we tend to find that the focus from um, the national leadership um, is on uh, clearing the way for build out, for middle mile, for making more spectrum available. Um, there are the various component pieces that get put in place that also work towards skills development. It's a, it's a total package um, of creating the right ecosystem for broadband to grow. So it's, you know, it, you have to unpack what it means to have a, have a plan. Uh, we didn't care if they called it a plan or a strategy or something else. But having the leadership and the national focus that it, it, we found makes the difference because it provides for, uh, it increases the deployment, and as a result of the increased deployment, it also focuses on, on other aspects, including skills development, and that leads to the, the shift um, and the significant, statistically significant increase in adoption. so it's not too hot next to yours. Uh, what we're going to do now, before we go to the next questions, is we're going to switch out the panels. We've got another two panels. I'm going to have the next two panels come out. We're going to thank, uh, in the normal way, uh, our third panel. <laughs> and keep those questions because I feel confident that whatever your points or questions for this panel will be well done by the next one. So uh, if we could have Virat, Alice, Chris, uh, Tomas and Subi, please come on up. We're going to combine the two panels. I'm a little concerned about our time since we're supposed to uh, uh, finish this up by 6 o'clock and we only have uh, too little time for the richness of this conversation. So, so as Virat gets ready, uh, the first panel is going to be on growing ICT infrastructure through workforce development. And Virat uh, from AT&T India is scheduled to start us off. So Virat, and if you could keep it as short, all the panels as short as possible. We obviously have a lot of questions and a lot of participation. You've got a microphone right in front of you. Thanks, Virat. So I'm going to run through some really quick numbers. Um, give you an idea. Uh, talked about the global numbers come down to what's happening in Asia, India, and then the rural piece and how it's impacting the workforce. So 7 billion mobile phones around the world by 2013. 3.5 billion of those are in Asia Pacific. India hosts 18% of the world's population, has 860 million connections, of which approximately 700 million are active. Africa is the least penetrated with 63%. 2.7 billion people on, in the world are online, of which 170 million reside in India. Half of those who are online are also on social media, approximately 90 million. Just in terms of numbers, that is bigger than the total vote cast on the last winning party in the last general election. So quite a large uh, number in terms of what you can do with those influences. 40% of the world's population is online. 77% of the developed world is online, but only 31% of the developing countries are online. 41% men and 37% women have access online, which means the gender access online has been much better than the gender access to mobile phones when that first began. Um, we have about 16 um, million broadband connections in India is divided to Mbps. 175 million expected by 2017 and 600 million broadband connections expected by 2020. Um, fixed broadband prices, as you're all aware, have dropped 82 percent since 2007. It's a big barrier which, which uh, was, was sort of the, the challenge, but the prices of smartphones haven't. So that remains as a, as a big problem. Um, two billion mobile broadband connections worldwide. Arab states, 71 million. Africa, 93. And Asia Pacific, um, 
890 million. Um, we think that the future for India, and I suppose by consequence for the rest of the developing world, will be mobile internet and mobile broadband. Now that's not cha easy because of the challenges that have just been spoken by the distinguished delegate from Indonesia. Um, we also think that um, in terms of pricing, mobile broadband prepaid is the cheapest, uh, while computer-based broadband postpaid is the most expensive. Um, in terms of strategies and going forward, we think um, from India point of view, I could sort of talk about the um, experience a little bit. Um, the, it's the most unique experience wherein 5% of the revenue contributed by every mobile subscriber every month was sitting in the USO fund, totaling up to $7 billion. And what was thought to be a sum that was required for putting out rural telephones was never needed because the business case for rural telephones works really well. What doesn't work is the business case for internet penetration, even in semi-urban. So the government has converted the law and redirected $4.5 billion of USO fund to build a national fiber optic network, which will connect 250,000 villages. And in the last mile, the operators will come in to provide broadband connectivity because signals will be carried very much till the last mile in rural India. This is a unique case. It's underway. By 2014, we should be ready with this network. That will change rural access, employment, and uh, propositions of future growth dramatically as we see it. But it requires more e-governance, more government-related material to go out online in languages. Just so you know, we have 22 official languages, 1,000 mother tongues, and a dialect every 15 kilometers. So not an easy one. <laughs> Thank you very much, Virat. Uh, having now heard a little bit about India, uh, we're going to a person who uh, I consider an IGF hero, uh, Alice Munya, who was uh, responsible for the Nairobi IGF, and uh, we are all still in her, her great debt. And she now has moved from uh, focusing on Kenya to focusing on the entire continent of Africa. Alice? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I come from a country that uh, has, I think, the, the greatest or the most examples of uh, successful initiatives, uh, especially because we tend to involve all the stakeholders uh, from a government perspective and from an uh, industry perspective. We tend to actually get, uh, get our hands dirty all together, nearly all stakeholders, you know, uh, civil society, government, uh, and, and industry, and also now increasingly the technical uh, community, and that has resulted in um, ex you know extremely successful uh, you know uh, initiatives, and also uh, you know a huge increase uh, in in the communication sector. You know, just uh, for example, our mobile penetration is now at nearly eighty percent. Um, you know, compared to um, four or five years ago, uh, at thirty point seven million, nearly uh, thirty one million Kenyans have access to mobile telephony. Uh, mobile traffic, however, declined by 1.2 percent between 2012 and 2013, and an increase in broadband uh, subscriptions by nearly 17.5 percent. Uh, in Kenya, we have an expression where we say "and we say," meaning you know we feel really great about it, but we can't say that yet because we still have a lot, uh, a long way to go. Uh, there's still quite a, a number of challenges, despite the fact that we launched our draft uh, broadband strategy, obviously with support from the U.S., uh, and we've kind of c come as far as defining what broadband means to us, uh, and it means uh, connectivity that is always on and delivers 5 Mbps to homes and businesses for high-speed access to video, data, and voice for <laughs> applications and devices. We still have a long way to go, uh, and there's a lot to uh, th there's a lot to be done to ensure that we, we actually achieve that uh, that vision. Uh, and with that, the Kenya the, you know the Kenya government especially uh, have always taken uh, an attitude of build and they will come. Uh, when you look at uh, the East African region, three or five years ago, 
was, did not have any single international fiber optic cable landing. The government of Kenya, working with the private sector, decided we are just going to build it and they will come. Uh, and in fact, more than 80% of the f uh, initial funding was put, or was, was put down by the government. And within two to three years, we, have, we, we now have three, uh, three fiber optic cables landing uh, in, in Mombasa, which, which is quite a great achievement. And that has seen an 80% decrease in, in, in bandwidth costs and an increase in internet access, obviously, uh, an increase in, in services and improved opportunities for uh, creativity, for innovation, you know, for knowledge creation and for information. Uh, and we continue to promote uh, uh, broadband capacity through you know, development, uh, uh, development of capacity, ensuring that there's a, uh, a conducive policy regulatory environment. Uh, as well as the government taking a lead in, for example, ensuring that citizens are able to use them by putting out services online, for example, our own open data uh, access. So we st uh, in terms of uh, what else needs to be done, I think I tend to agree with, with Bob Pepper here. There's quite a lot to be done in terms of, okay, yes, we do have a, a broadband strategy, but how do we implement it? It needs to be practical. Um, as well as agreeing with Jackie here that uh, while uh, the government defines constantly looks at private uh, public partnerships, I think we do need the multi-stakeholder uh, aspect so that we are taking care of the demand, the demand sign fully in terms of uh, engaging users and the civil society and other stakeholders, not just the private and public sector. Um, and a regulatory environment that also ensures that we are managing spectrum in a way that, uh, that is uh, sustainable. Uh, currently, I think spectrum, uh, rather than becoming just a mere, merely a technical issue, has also become a political issue. Uh, obviously, because of you know, uh, you know radio and, and and television, and so that is something that I think requires quite a lot of political will, and not just in Kenya but Africa generally, in terms of uh, freeing uh, broadband spectrum, mobile spectrum uh, for use for mobile uh, for mobile broadband. Uh, and also perhaps using TV white spaces uh, as well to cover, you know, uh, to cover areas, uh, uh, some of the rural areas. I think I'll stop there and wait for well, questions. Terrific. Thank you. And I, and I would just add uh, to what Alice was just saying. Uh, Kenya, I think, in my experience, is one of the best examples of the importance of political will. Uh, uh, Alice worked uh, very closely with some great leaders uh, both the permanent secretary and a number of uh, ministers who basically identified the submarine cable access as being the single most important way of bringing that connectivity and over tremendous potential barriers made sure that that happened. It was really, it's a sign that at the top, if you have that political will, much can happen. Chris, you're going to talk to us a little bit about uh, Mozilla? Sure, and actually you, you set me up very well, though I'm going to reframe a little bit on the fly. Um, <clears throat> So my, my topic and my approach to this is, is quite different than, than the others, but I think it plays into the political will narrative very well by talking about what can happen when you do get broadband connections out to this world. So my focus is on uh, a different layer than the installation of the telecom infrastructure. It's, it's more about the devices and the users in the developing world that will use this and the economic benefits that can be generated by that, that then I think contributes to the political will and the political uh, conversation that you need to have to get these national broadband plans out there, to get the investment into that infrastructure. So Mozilla works very differently than the other companies represented here today. Um, we self-identify as a project and as a global community. There are <clears throat> hundreds, actually well over a thousand people who contribute to the Mozilla Firefox web browser code base who are not paid Mozilla staff. They're volunteers. Some of them make a small amount of money as, as part-time contributors. Uh, they're part of our family. We send them T-shirts. We send them computers sometimes. <laughs> they, uh, they're, they're part of our community. And these are people from all around the world, from, from many, many, many countries around the world. Uh, and what that means for this conversation is just I want to bear in mind, I want us all to bear in mind the power of the people here the power of the local communities that we're trying to tap into, and the real economic benefits that these communities can generate for their country and for the world, the contributions that are latent out here to the global digital economy that we're trying to tap into. So, so when I looked at workforce development in the title of this panel, it's not to me just about the workers that install 
the telecom cables, though that's obviously a big part of it. It's also about the workers who are empowered by that, who use that infrastructure to then create and go and grow. So the other thing I want to talk about is how Mozilla is trying to contribute, and that's this device. This is the Firefox phone. I think there's a real big gap that changes when you go from having mobile connectivity to broadband over mobile and to broadband over mobile connected to a smartphone. Um, that's why I'm excited about this. Uh, I'm also a, a bit of an engineer, and so I'm excited about the engineering for this, but I won't geek out about that at this panel. Um, instead, I will talk about two things. First, this is a smartphone. It has a web browser. It uh, allows you to share content, play games, listen to music, take pictures. It's an open smartphone, so you can write and use your own apps for it. Um, but the second part is the bigger one. It's cheap. It's $80 unsubsidized. That's a fraction of the cost of an iPhone or a good Android phone, and that's why Mozilla is very excited about this. It's like three, you know, slightly older hardware if you're used to a, a U.S. subsidized phone. But we have a lot of a lot of hope that this, when we're able to roll it out more broadly, will help address some of that gap that was identified by my previous panelists earlier. Um, and we think that uh, it, it rolled out in Brazil a couple of days ago, and it's in a handful of other countries around the world. So. I was a little bit of an advertisement, and I apologize for that. But I wanted to use that to talk about what will happen here, right? And to, to put a face on this, to, to get you to picture an amateur web developer in Zimbabwe who gets a smartphone, who gets a connection to a broadband infrastructure, who starts writing apps, who starts generating economic gain for their community, for their country, and in fact contributing to the entire global world by writing an app that anyone in the world can use. So I think that's a big part of the future that we're all collectively working towards. And honestly, I think we're almost there. And that's pretty exciting. That's tremendous, and I understand that all the panelists get one of the new Firefox. Uh, no, uh, sorry, I did not bring enough to share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just for the audience. All right, we're going to keep going here, and then we're going to go as we did the, with the first sort of combined panel. Uh, Subi, can you talk, uh, well, why don't we just go with you, if you don't mind, Subi, we'll sure. go first. Sure. Uh, from India, uh, I think everyone knows Subi, everyone in the world knows Subi, uh, <laughs> a professor uh, in India at the Lady Sri uh, Ram College. Thank you, Ambassador Gross. Thank you for that introduction. I think uh, bingo, certainly not, but Russian roulette, definitely. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. I want to start first by uh, Tarima Kasi Bali, which is um, I accept with love. Uh, the kind of passion that language brings together. And as Indians go, stories are really important to our culture. The India story is about telling stories. And when we talk about the importance of local content, communication and content is about the ability to tell stories, to tell stories in languages that people can identify with, associate with. At the periphery, there might be a lot of things, but at the core, the internet, the wonderful, empowering thing that we know as the internet, and I will just come to broad by the access in just a second. It is about the ability to be able to communicate in languages that people understand. When it came to industries, the story is phenomenal. There are laws that make sure and ensure that when you're working in domestic economies, there is a certain amount of local integration, whether it's manufacturing or parts that we see. There is no such thing that exists for local content, and local content needs upstreaming. It needs to be pulled up. When it comes to organizations like uh, Viacom, the Walt Disney, I have a fellow panelist here. My life choices were informed by what I saw on TV. Um, which restaurant where I would eat my food was determined by what they had in the lobby. So when they played Tom and Jerry, I was there, and so were my parents. A lot of these choices are influenced by cultural preferences. As someone who studies the media, we did an experiment, and that's why I'm probably here, and that's the story that I want to tell. These are young women journalism students who run a website called The Salt List org it is called satire in the age of letters and technology they use twenty dollar cell phones to record community media and that is what they're sharing commenting and discussing issues that they they care about the world is moving towards narrow casting of course broadband is important but concerns of hyper local communities issues that don't get reflected by big media are not just big data I think big media is an equally important question the multiplicity and plurality that comes in developing countries like India. And Virat shared some numbers. And I want to throw some more at you. My head is swimming with numbers right now. But I'll make it as quick as possible. Um, 
we're at 30 billion right now in terms of revenue, 1.6% in terms of contribution to the GDP. This in the next two years can change to 350 million people coming online. And in terms of revenue, 100 billion US dollars and about 3.3% contribution to India's GDP, which is big numbers. When it comes to challenges and the obstacles, and that is where our issues lie for developing country perspective, not just um, infrastructure in terms of last mile connectivity and an optic fiber cable, which is the wonderful experiment that we are just alluded to, the USFO fund that is empowering 250 rural self-governments, um, local panchayats, and putting them online. But the issue is, despite the fact that there is a pilot project running, there is no content. Um, Garland just alluded to the idea of power and sustainable power that needs to be made available. The roles that each of us can play becomes really important important. And this is the issue that we have to tackle. Broadband access not just needs to be universalized, but it also needs to be contextualized. And we have to get governments to do more. There's an experiment in India called data.gov, but we don't have data sets and we don't have voluntary information coming across from governments. Health records, land records, these are the things that we need for citizens to be able to engage better. Um, local content, I can't emphasize more. And I, I want to give the floor across to Tom perhaps who can talk about the importance and what we can do more in terms of uh, integrating content and how big media also can play a bigger role. I do want you to respond to that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tomas so from, uh, from Disney, in case anybody around here doesn't know. <laughs> All right, uh, first question is for Chris. Does your phone come with preloaded Disney content? <laughs> Jeez, uh, you, then, then you have work to do. Uh, <laughs> All right. Jokes aside, I think uh, what, what, what Subi said uh, uh, is a fantastic segue because indeed what we are seeing from a global perspective, and as you may know, Walt Disney is a global company, but we develop all of our content in local language around the world. And India is a great example when we partner and we actually uh, own uh, the UTV studio in India, which is a, probably the largest Bollywood studio. So the movies there in India are uh, in in, in lo different local uh, Indian languages. Uh, they are for the local population based on local stories. And indeed, storytelling is absolutely essential there. That's what drives, and we all know that, maybe you, you have read the UNESCO ISOC OECD report of two years ago. Content, and local content in particular, in local language, linked to local stories, that's what drives broadband <laughs> adoption in, in, in many countries, and in particular, emerging economies. Um, and by content, I mean, there are different forms of content. There, there, there is a professional content, so think large blockbusters like the one Bollywood Studios uh, and, and ourselves do. That's one. You have UGC, uh, user generated content, and what you can produce yourself, you know, shooting your own video. You have also public content, so all the archives. And at uh, one of the main sessions during the IGF, we had a good a good discussion with UNESCO about that. Uh, I don't know if some of you were there, but what they are doing, uh, uh, they are actually, there is a tradition in, in the Balinese culture to write stories on, on palm tree leaves. They write you know, uh, traditional stories. And uh, it is a tradition which is disappearing because all the generations are going. So there is a project to actually keep that content by uh, making it digital and actually by translating it in other languages to keep the tradition alive. So that's also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, so that's also part of this heritage content which is so important for local communities around the world. Having said that, uh, talking about content, uh, once you have uh, uh, indeed the broadband capacity and the devices, it's not enough per se. I mean, content doesn't fall from the sky. You have the storytelling, but you have to have the, also the content development infrastructure in place. And that's what also uh, uh, Subi uh, was, w was talking about. So I would very briefly, and I will use one example before going there, which is the example of Nollywood. So Nollywood is the uh, 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 Hollywood from Nigeria, which is the very large industry in Nigeria. And by the way, Nollywood is the second largest movie producing industry in the world after Bollywood in India. It's 40 films, 40 movies a week. Every week, week after week after week. So it's a lot of movies. Having said that, one of the issues that Nollywood is facing is that it's not really making money. It's not really generating enough revenue to make it a, 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 sus a long-term sustainable industry. The movie cost per project is on average $40,000. $40,000. 
think about some Hollywood projects are running into the $300 million per movie. I'm not saying that's the same thing, but it gives you an idea. The issue for Nollywood, and we are working with a number of people there in, in Nigeria, is to develop an infrastructure, a legal infrastructure in particular, to help develop the sales, the distribution, and also that the, the actors, the producers, the directors get some revenue back so they can invest in the, in the next project and make it bigger with bigger names from Nigeria and other African countries. So think about, uh, um, since we were also talking about uh, legal issues, e-commerce regulation for the countries for the distribution of, of, of content. Think about, excuse me, uh, consumer protection infrastructure. Uh, I know it sounds grand, but it's important. So people who buy the movies online uh, can also have some degree of protection. Think about uh, protection for free expression also, part of this legal framework that's very important to make sure that people who have ideas, who have scripts, can, can pr pr shoot movies the way they want. And the last one is, is also protection uh, for intellectual property. In the case of Nollywood, this is recognized by the government and the Federation of, of, of uh, Nigerian actors, producers, and directors as, as being a key element. So what I'm just saying here, and I, I will stop there, is that local content is key for broadband development in local language. That, that's essential, so the storytelling is relevant for local communities. That's what we have seen all over the world. But this also needs a legal framework in place, the same way that broadband development needs a legal framework. Thank you. You see that there are, you know, there are millions of stories of uh, empowering uh, fishermen in India, rural workers. You don't have to order your medicines, your food, your newspapers, your your dry cleaning. Everything in Delhi and big cities happens over the phone. So there are millions and millions of people who are empowered because of the phones. We don't even know how they actually had a job before this. Uh, but now the plumber doesn't have to go back home to know that he has to go to the next place. He's just on the move all day. And we also phased out pages in about three months or so. We never had pages in India. But the phone system worked because the prices fell, and the prices of the handset fell, and the access fell. But I go to the point about broadband access and how it's going to go finally, you know, the, the whole thing about content and the, and the local content. And I think the, 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 the killer app from India will be... Wonderful. And with that, with that slight musical interlude here, we open it up for questions and comments. Here we go. Top that. Thank you. Um, my name is Farid. I'm from Grameen Foundation in Indonesia. Uh, the title is very interesting. Why I stopped here, actually, have never planned to come here. It is bringing the broadband to those who need the most. Who are these people who need the most? Number one, my question. Um, my organization works with poverty, so it's like, you know, nail, uh, hammer always look everything like a nail. So I also have that bias, meaning that from my work point of view is that I think those, those who need the people is the poor people, the people who are living in $2.50. There's 147 million of them here in Indonesia. So <clears throat> my question is, is that broadband that really contributes? Is there any broadband contribution directly to them, or just connectivities, mobile phone? You know, we have Grameen have uh, several. Uh, we work on mobile phone. We have several um, initiatives in Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, but I don't think that broadband really matters. It's just a connectivity. Kenya, famous Mpesa can run in SMS. Even in in Indonesia, uh, a lot of the uh, content of 2G. Uh, content, 3G content supposed to be del delivered, oh, sorry, the 2G content supposed to be delivered in 3G networks. So what the industry actually contribute to providing a content that really matters to these people who need the most? For me, it's like people who are living in the base of pyramid. Thank you. Can I, can I respond to that? has had a lot of experience in this area. Maybe make a comment, and then Virat, you could, if you could comment, and anybody else. Um, I think there's a lot that broadband can and can contribute to poor people, and I think yeah, yeah uh, you mentioned it. Although I think for, for for the case of Africa, for example, 
uh, you know, despite the various challenges. Um, one of the reasons why governments, are, African governments, are clamoring to ensure that broadband is available, uh, you know, at all levels, is exactly that: to uh, to bring you know, to to enable and increase innovative applications for development. You know, MPESA is one of them to make it fast, speedier, more secure. You know, and to build on you know additional applications that are similar that you know for for education purposes, you know for health purposes, for agricultural purposes. That's exactly the point. In that, you know, if we have fast uh, and, and speedy broadband, then uh, all of those uh, facilities will be available because of the fact that we have so many other challenges in case of you know, for example, infrastructure. So then we are able to deliver uh, uh, on all the other development goals that we have. All right. Um, this is exactly the debate that we had in 1995 and 1996 when mobile phones were being launched and each one of them used to cost a thousand dollars. And the bureaucrats came at us and said, we don't need mobile phones, what we need is more fixed line phones. Don't do this stuff. And it changed everybody's lives, the poorest of the poor. So my request is please don't second guess the importance of broadband when the connectivity is there to those who need it the most. We have gone through this, we, we were told by politicians and bureaucrats, and they gave the contracts to the private sector, like they are doing in Myanmar, because they didn't think there was a market for it. Otherwise, the government would have run it forever. They gave it out because they didn't believe this was going to ever work. And it wasn't going to work because it was 50 cents to a call, it's less than a cent to a call now. So this whole thing changes. But let me also give you three quick examples. E-knowledge, e-governance, and e-health and e-schools. We probably cannot build brick and mortar schools fast enough to educate 60% of the population that's below 25. We're the youngest nation in the world and the world's second largest nation. We have to deliver knowledge on screens and on broadband. We have to deliver health and x-rays on screens. We cannot build the hospitals the way the West has. We cannot build the schools the way the West has. We will have to circumvent, even for the poorest of the poor, broadband connectivity not just the smartphones, will be life-changing in the next five to seven years. All right, we have time for one more question. We have a gentleman over here. Let me see if I can get over. Excuse me, Carl. Thank you. My name is uh, Walu Bengo from Kenya. I have two questions, if you allow me. Uh, one for the gentleman from India. You say your government is providing fiber to villages. And I just thought about Kenya, where government actually pulled fiber to districts and wants to go to constituency level. But here's the question. The operators are not using that government platform. They are building their own fiber all the way. That's one. Then the second question um, is to the first panel, the broadband group, uh, where you say you need a broadband plan and things will look good. But... Recently, Kenya launched the broadband plan, and I think Alice alluded to it. Implementation, how do you go about it? Because you can launch with a lot of fanfare, you know, and then they file it somewhere in, 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 the, in, in the government offices. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants? Uh, okay. So to, to your question about fiber, I didn't sort of go into the details, but it's called DHQ district headquarters. So the fiber is being taken to the district headquarters. <coughs> And, from, and, and, the, and the private sector is not building it because there is no business case in the private sector to take fiber to the district headquarters. But once the big fat fiber reaches the district headquarters, then there are sufficient number of people who will take it from their small community operators who will take it. The business case for them is not yet clear. It's not clear what they will do with it. And therefore, the broadband plan, the second question that you spoke about, should start with a plan then should go to spectrum, as, as some of my colleagues spoke about, to put the spectrum out there, get it regulated, um, get the national fiber optic network and backbone going because people expect the private sector to do it. They don't do it. They will just do because they, it. Because there is no business case. You can't justify it to the board. Somebody has to come. So public investment has to come back through this route. And as I said, this is an innovative way we are doing it. Um, reduce the price of access. Reduce the price of smartphones. Um, local language content has been spoken about and get the government content, forms, applications, passports, all that stuff in local languages. And I think that's where to build it. That's when the business case will start trickling in from rural areas. But if you don't build the infrastructure, 
then it will never start. Public funding, and in this case, by the way, imagine this. The consumers are paying for the infrastructure. Those who are using mobile phones are paying for the broadband infrastructure. It's not a penny from the government's pocket. And we're still left with $3 billion. We can hold on IGF. And <laughs> right, Subi? Um, a Twitter response to your question, and I want to integrate that too. I think the private sector and the government can do more. Sorry, Verizon, and sorry, AT&T. There is a lot more that we want from companies, and they have a lot to contribute. Um, when, when we made the journey from the slave to the citizen, let us remember that we want more, and we need to get more. This is not about being handed out charity. We're a country of aspiration and we're a country of dreams. When we talk about emerging economies and developing countries, we have uh, people who come from villages with memory cards and chip cards and they download lectures, MIT lectures, open source lectures, and they go back to the villages. And that is what broadband can change. It can change the fact that you don't have to buffer your videos and lectures anymore. Um, it is also important and it's a very relevant point. What happens to those grand plans and schemes? There are pilot projects and there is one person who's been trained in every house, in every village, out of the 250,000 villages. But there is no power. So they're sitting with a box, and they don't know what to do with it. And that is where governments have to come in. So referring back to the Tunis agenda again, rightful roles of each stakeholder. And yes, we need broadband access, and we need to universalize that broadband access. Pep, you wanted to respond to the initial question. No. Are actually... Our time is up, so let me, with that enthusiastic uh, last comment, let us not only thank this panel and the first panel and Ambassador Sokolova, but also let us thank Garland McCoy, who put this together and who's been sheepishly sitting in the back. And let me thank you all for your attendance, uh, and again, thank you very much. See you next year. And thank you, Jack. Round of applause for the... Thank you.